Uh, right, so part two of uh, mental health capacity. Hopefully we'll have a few more people drop in. Um, so uh, we are under time constraints as we always are, but um, I just want to do a very quick introduction to the guys for anyone that hasn't, um, that wasn't part of part one and doesn't know who the people we've got on, the experts are on. Uh, we have Nicola uh, Bushby, a partner uh, in the private client and tax team at Boodle Hatfield particular area of strength in respect of court protection, uh, contentious financial applications uh, concerning estates and business. Uh, Stephanie Paris, uh, partner at um, Clarion in the private client team. Uh, also a huge amount of experience in this area um, and, and also is an accredited member uh, for the solicitors for the elderly. And then finally, we have Lynn Marshall, who is a registered uh, mental health nurse and has been for nearly 40 years, lecturer, advisor on clinical policy and practice. So we've got three really experienced people on the call today. Um, in terms of what we're gonna run through or running order, uh, we, we're looking at financial abuse, what it looks like, possible remedies, vulnerability, undue influence and the powers of, uh, to, to, to help and what their limits are. And then we're gonna look at estate planning when someone loses capacity and then finally detention under the Mental Health Act. Um, so, uh, Nicola, I think you're going to kick off with this one, uh, because you are, as I say, you've got to go in well, about 10 minutes, basically. So yeah, <laughs> if I can hand over. No, just hand to my, through my bit. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, sort of cover the financial abuse aspect of today. Um, so, I mean, I think we all kind of understand colloquially what financial abuse is, um, but really it's about um, people, uh, uh, perpetrators, alleged perpetrators, taking money, assets, or procuring some financial advantage um, for themselves away from the vulnerable, incapacitous, elderly person. Um, I certainly receive... Um, lots of inquiries about financial abuse sadly I think it has risen um obviously you know Covid where everybody was um you know locked away uh did nothing to to help that situation Hope quick quick, okay. quick question on the on the um um when um we went into lockdown everything started being more virtual did, did that create a spike in the number of cases of abuse I think, yes, I think it did cause an increase in financial abuse. And I think also we're seeing some of the effects now in terms of the wills which were executed during that period. I think they are sort of now coming out. I can see um, Steph is nodding her head. So she's obviously also experienced the same. Um, so I think that didn't help, certainly. But I think irrespective of COVID, it's an issue um, that that needs tackling um, and it's still very prevalent. Um, and only increasing, I think, sadly. Um, so, yeah, so it could be transferring a property, getting somebody, a vulnerable, incapacitous person to sign a transfer document, signing their house away or a property away. Um, it could be using their bank passwords to um, secure a, you know, bank a transfer to themselves of sometimes a, a significant sum of money, might be using their cash card to go out and get cash out or use for things for themselves. So, um, you know, there can be a kind of whole spectrum of, of financial abuse, um, you know, of, of, you know, a huge sort of range of value, um, but, you know, irrespective of value, if you discover this and, you know, it can be really devastating for families. Is, is the, the property transfer one that essentially you, you might not even notice because it's not like you're actually moving the house or you're not moving money. You're just sort of, it's just papers that have changed. Well, sometimes, yeah, it can be discovered much later. Um, and that, I mean, it's obviously it's OK if you discover it before it happens and before that transfer is affected. But if you discover it after, like, what do you do? Um, and or it might be discovered on death. It might be, you know, it might become a sort of probate post death issue um, for beneficiaries of estates to then try and rectify. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, you know, it doesn't it's not necessarily discovered at the right time, as these things often on. Um, mm. So there's there's a sort of the whole the whole range who kind of carries these, um, uh, you know, types of um, thing, uh, you know, who are the uh, 
potential perpetrators of this, sort of neighbours, friends, family members, and obviously um, attorneys under powers of attorney. And that's why, you know, you often hear me banging the drum about the importance of who you choose as an attorney. You really need to trust them because they stand in your shoes. They have the, they have a document in their hand which says, look, I can do all these things effectively. So you're handing that level of trust over to that person. And so obviously most the majority of, of um, LPAs are used properly but there are some that aren't um, and so you know, you know what can you do in those situations um, and just sort of quickly running through that so obviously there's two issues first of all you need to stop the financial abuse um, and second of all you need to rectify things if money and assets has, have been taken um, in terms of stopping it if you if the um, abuse was say perpetrated by an attorney under an LPA, then you can apply to the court of protection to revoke the power. Or of course, if the bill has capacity, they could revoke it. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it's the court of protection. It's only the court of protection who has the power to um, to revoke revoke an LPA. Um, and of course, if it's if it's a family member, or it's a, a relative or, or an, a, a friend and this has happened, then query how it's got to that stage. Does this person lack capacity? Do they need a deputy putting in place? Is, has this happened because there's sort of a, the vacuum where somebody is either very um, where somebody has lost capacity, they can't they can no longer manage their affairs. And so somebody has been able to do this. So do you need to sort of put arrangements in place? Um and I think, um, and then the other thing, the the other issue, the second issue about how you go about rectifying the situation, um, the court of protection can't set aside a transaction. So there's no point if you're looking to restore, say, a property back to the original owner. You can't apply to the court of protection for that to happen. You would have to go to the high court and you would have to set out your evidence as to why that property should be restored back to its original owner, either um, a capacity argument or an undue influence argument. And how long does that take, ballpark range, average or whatever? The I I mean I I I done set aside sort of applications in the high court. Luckily, I did I, I did do a, um, a a very valuable transaction, and we had to set it aside. But we managed to do it on an expedited timetable, actually, because we were concerned about the life expectancy of um of of the the, the vulnerable party, and so we actually managed to get it expedited. And there were various other reasons. So that concluded sort of within four or five months, but that's not normal. Normally, mm. you'll be looking at, you know, you could a year, more than a year. Mm. Um, How do you find, Nicola, um, do, do clients go to, if it's a, a family member that's been the perpetrator, do you find that clients will take it one step further and get the police involved? If the police are involved, what's their appetite to even be interested in financial abuse? Yeah, I don't know what your experience is, um, Steph, but certainly my experience of the police wanting to get involved in these matters is 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 almost like non-existent. Um, okay. I mean, the the transaction that I dealt with was multi it was a multi million pound transaction, but the police didn't action it. They didn't. They, they just refer to it as a as a civil matter. Mm -hmm. You can go off into the courts to to resolve that, but there doesn't seem to be any appetite on the on behalf of the police to to pick these kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've even had the police say in one case that. They even looked, well, what's going to happen? It was an elderly person. What's going to happen when they pass away? And the will obviously left it to the perpetrator because they'd obviously also unduly influenced the creation of a new will, which left them everything as well. And the police kind of said, well, our hands are tied because when they pass away, it's all going to go to this person anyway. So what's the what's the point in trying to unpick it? And that's where we had to go and get a stat will application, which I'll talk about yeah. in, a bit, in a minute. But it, it's it's a, a minefield, isn't it, of... Do the police take a different approach if it's family as to whether it's not family? No, no, not from my not from my experience. How how is it not theft? Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's a dishonesty offence. Yeah, because I say it's a civil matter. I would have thought theft was not a civil matter. I'm not a lawyer, but I, suppose I, the, no, the I, I agree with you, and I think that that is right. Um, but I think it is so prevalent that if the police 
picked all of it all of it up I just don't think that they've got the resources to process it I think that's the problem the typical defenses we we hear I'm sure you're the same Nicola is oh well it was a loan or mum meant to give me it or she had capacity to give me it it wasn't theft and it's it's very rare you get an you know a um where it's not someone who's related to the to the to the victim mm. where the perpetrator is not related to them so there becomes a whole host of arguments over well was it actually is the burden that high that it was theft um so it's it's very rare it's you know someone who's not known to them where yeah. it's a bit easier to prove <laughs> in my experience as well court of protection i've been so disappointed um how long and how reluctant they seem to get involved and that's even from a point of view of um, safeguarding being raised by social services um, and it's like a year 18 months on and they've done very little uh, I really do worry about the court of protection and is, sorry is, was the multi-million pound one that you mentioned Nicola was that relative close relatives not relative? yeah was was close relatives yeah close relative yeah and we had to um we had to go to the high court to get it set aside which we did do yeah. um and we had to show that I mean that was under an LPA and we had to show that actually that she didn't have the authority and it was yeah. benefited her only um so yeah we had to sort of go through the process of of proving all the necessary sort of components but yeah we were successful in getting that set aside but that's what you need to do and and obviously it depends on the value because that's fine when you're dealing with huge transactions like that because yeah. of course you need to sort it out and it's worth worth the money sorting it out but when it's small on a smaller scale I, I think it's very difficult for families to access remedies because really they need legal advice but that legal advice is very expensive compared to what's been taken but the principle is exactly the same um quite often the victim is either incapacitated by the by the time it comes out or has, dis has passed away by the time it comes out and then your evidence as to what, what actually was the motive behind the transaction is again really hard to prove um it's not it's not normal that you've got someone who's the victim who can say, no, I never agreed to that transaction or I never knew they were going to do that or they never explained that to me or I never agreed to that. So it's it's mm. extremely difficult. Nicola, I'm conscious that we're running low on time and um, I don't know, I th well, this is the, the abuse and vulnerability and undue influence kind of all merge into each other, kind of. Um, yeah, I think the only thing, the only sort of final thing that I would mention before I have to run off is... Um, is this issue of sort of what I would, what I call, and I think others in um, the um, sort of practice area call like the twilight zone, which is where you've got somebody who doesn't lack capacity. You might they might see a doctor, and the doctor confirms that they've got capacity, um, but they are still very vulnerable and highly susceptible to influence. And so you've got this sort of grey area because, of course, if somebody lacks capacity you can go to the court of protection and there are various remedies um, and under the court of protection. Um, but if they, if they, um, if they are just, well, not just, but if they retain capacity, but are otherwise vulnerable and susceptible to influence, then the, the court of protection doesn't have the same powers. Um, it has what's called the inherent jurisdiction, which can cover this sort of gray area in between, but it is used exceedingly sparingly um and and in very sort of specific circumstances it's not it's certainly not liberally applied and so you've got sort of su this sort of area or this this um um these people that kind of fall through this gap and what you can do in that kind of situation um i'm actually just um in the process of not to plug my article but in, i'm writing an article about this exact point about the twilight zone the inherent jurisdiction um and what remedies and, and what families can be thinking about um well nicola we'll get that out to everyone that's on and, and maybe people that were on part one as well yeah okay um sorry i've got to run lovely to see no. you and, um, <laughs> hand over to all these other um great people Cheers. Thank you. Hope you get on time. Bye. Thank you. Okay. So uh, next section, I think, was going to be Steph, and you were going to talk about estate planning when someone has lost capacity. Yes. Um, thank you. So I suppose the, the first, the first assumption to not make is that just because someone's had a diagnosis of 
a, a degenerative illness perhaps does not necessarily mean that they lack capacity to do estate planning. We have plenty of clients who will have had a diagnosis. Lynn's nodding. So we'll have plenty of clients who will have a diagnosis and, and instantly all the advisors around say, oh, we can't do anything now. We can't update the will. We can't we can't update the nominations. We can't you know, do do the, the what we were planning on doing. Um, and that's just not simply the case in many situations. We'll get someone like Lynn involved who with the right um, uh, setting for the individual, you quite often can get them to have the requisite capacity to do the estate planning. It might take a bit longer. It might need to be done a bit differently. It will need assessments doing to protect all the parties involved who are giving the advice. But just because someone has a diagnosis, the first point is do not think that that is an instant game over. Um, <clears throat> but if if sadly we have gone past uh, the time where it, it would be, uh, we would be able to do work for them um, in their normal individual capacity, what can we still then do? Um, and I, I, I was making some notes this morning and put this into four sections. I, first, I suppose the first I thought of was, well, what can you do with the other individual family members that's not necessarily the, the party who's lost capacity? Um, and sometimes this comes around care fee planning, which I completely appreciate for most of our clients is not even in their sphere of thought because they're, they're so high net worth. But for, for a lot of clients where one, there may be a married couple where one has lost capacity, there is still things that can be done by the perhaps spouse who does have capacity to try and do some estate planning work there around perhaps changing their will, perhaps changing their estate plan so that it doesn't just pass all to the individual who's lost capacity. Maybe we need to do some planning around their estate to perhaps put some life interest trusts in their will um, or some right to occupies. Um, again, that generally is around the care fee planning side, and that is for a very small section of our clients. But you do, you there are there are not things that uh, there are not things that are applicable to everybody, but it's something that can be thought through. What can we do for the spouse who has to do? Um, the next point I thought through was statutory wills. So statutory wills are wills for clients who lack the requisite capacity to do an ordinary will. Um, so clients who perhaps have never had capacity or have lost capacity and cannot therefore instruct a lawyer because they don't understand and they wouldn't pass Lynn's test to, to write a will themselves. You apply to the Court of Protection um, and it's a, a long process with lots of evidence that has to be put forward, but you apply to the court for them to effectively um, approve and sign the will on behalf of the incapacitated person. Um, we do quite a few of those and um, they are not without their pitfalls to get them approved. You have to join lots of parties quite often to the application, particularly anyone who's going to have their position changed as a result of what you're doing. Um, but when we typically look at doing statutory wills, it might be because the client's um, intestate and that's just not appropriate for them and we need to put a will in place for them. Uh, maybe their estate has significantly changed in size since the last time they did a will um, and we need to revisit that uh, and the court would approve a new will in that situation. Um, quite often it's that example I gave earlier where there has been some element of financial abuse. The abuser has um, facilitated, let's say, a will being prepared in perhaps um, inappropriate circumstances, whether that be they've written it out themselves or they've gone on makeawill.com and printed it out and got the client to sign it. And then you need to go to the court of protection to, to get a new will prepared that takes that perpetrator out of the uh, inappropriate will. Um, we've done. And how long does that take, Steph? How long would you? There is a fast. There is a, there is a, there is a fast, tr a fast track. Again, I use. Uh, uh, I use the word fast loosely. There is a fast track procedure um, if we think the client has a limited life expectancy. But if not, and even that is not fast, if not, it can be 12 months plus to get a statutory will application. Think of all the parties that have to be joined. Depends if they're going to get representation, if they think that they're going to be prejudicially affected by what the new will is going to do. Um, it, it becomes full contentious proceedings that will go to hearing. Quite often the official solicitor will be involved who represents the person who lacks capacity because the test through all of this is what is in P, the incapacitated person's best interests. It's not necessarily what they would have done, what they should do for inheritance tax planning. It's what's in their best interest. So 
Um, it's not a it's not a rubber stamping exercise that a solicitor just sends a will in and it gets stamped by the court. It is can very easily go into full contentious proceedings. So that was my second point: is that when they are necessary, they are doable. Uh, the ideal situation, though, is that the client has done their estate planning and their will in such a flexible way before they've lost capacity that we don't then need to go and change it at court. Um, my third point was around statutory gifts. So statutory gifts are where clients, again, lack the capacity to gift themselves. As you probably all know, there is very limited ability for an attorney or a deputy to do life gifting of the of the um, individual who they act for's assets and remember gifting is not just like giving away an asset it could be selling something at an undervalue to somebody or it could be um making a loan on not commercial terms so um gifting is wider than purely just transferring assets and as i said there's very limited uh ability for attorneys and deputies to do that pretty much it has to be a customary occasion like birthday or Christmas. It has to be to a relative or someone closely connected to them. And it has to be reasonable in value compared to the size of their estate. So it's not going to be the type of IHT gifting that we will be thinking of doing for our clients without going to the court for approval. And the statutory gift is that process of going to the court of protection. Again, it's full proceedings to say you want the court's approval to make this gift. Um, and again, it's very similar process to the uh, statutory will. Quite often this uh, official solicitor will be involved. Um, it is possible to ask the court to approve it for inheritance tax planning purposes, but you will still need to show how it's in the, the individual's best interest. And that's where financial advisors will be brilliant at doing that cash flow modelling exercise to say, well, actually, they've got enough, they're never going to run out, we can still give this gift in their lifetime. And no matter what happens for any eventuality in their health deteriorating, they will be fine. Um, so when you do statutory gifting in particular, you do need a financial advisor certainly involved to support the fact that this is hopefully not going to prejudice the, the person who's making the gift to the donor. And then I suppose the fourth element before I pass over to Lynn that I just wanted to talk about and how you do estate planning for someone who's lost capacity is just remember it doesn't need to be any element of gifting. Estate planning could just be taking appropriate qualified financial advice and going into a, an investment that perhaps gives that relief from inheritance tax. And because there is no element of gifting there, you are just, whether it's an aim portfolio or something that qualifies for business relief, that won't on the face of it immediately require the court's approval because you're not giving the asset away. The asset does still belong to the, to the client. What we always need to remember and remind attorneys though, it's, it's, it's what's in the client's best interest, not what's in your best interest as the ultimate beneficiary who's now not gonna pay as much inheritance tax. So we do again, always need to make sure that we have a suitably qualified financial advisor giving that advice. It's an appropriate amount that is being placed perhaps into a, uh, an aim portfolio the level of risk is is documented and is appropriate for for the client's attitude to risk because as most of you all know that those products uh, that get uh, inheritance tax relief are obviously sometimes <laughs> uh, higher risk for the client so chucking it all in there i think the court would have something to say about and um, the other one that everybody talks about is making sure that attorneys and deputies are not trying to get the uh, incapacitated person to invest in their own business. Quite often you will see children saying, yes, but mum can invest, I'll invest mum's money in my business. It'll get business relief after a couple of years. And, you know, it's a guaranteed safe bet. That is a massive no-no red flag to the court. I don't know if anyone heard that lizard case from about 10 years ago where there was a client, uh, an individual who was being persuaded by a family member to uh, invest in a reptile business because it was a dead cert for, <laughs> for, for return. And obviously the court had a lot to say about that. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. I, I suppose the main point is just because someone's had a diagnosis doesn't mean you can't do estate planning. There are ways to do it, not too straightforward, but I suppose the main takeaway is if we can get the estate planning done before the capacity has been lost or it's set up in such a flexible way that will allow us to make changes even if they lost capacity um that that would be the preferred <laughs> the preferred route 
that does quite segue nicely into Lynn, actually. On, on, on um, thank you, Steph. Uh, on in terms of detention under the Mental Health Act, because it's not as cataclysmic and as all um, and game over as it, it sounds to me as a non-expert in this area, Lynn. Um, yeah, can I can I just add as well that before we start that. Um, when you introduced me to start with, yes, I am a mental health nurse and I do still work on the nursing bank, um, but I'm retired from my previous job and I've been doing mental capacity assessments now for about seven years. I've did additional training and qualifications um, to be what's called a best interest assessor. So I'm also involved in deprivation of liberty safeguarding assessments in care homes which is a whole nother subject, which we haven't got time to go into oh, today. So um, so when I do do um, when I do work as a nurse, I'm working on a older people's inpatient unit. Um, so I think probably that's the it's probably the older people that this is more relevant to, because um, we do have a lot of issues around finances um, are where I work. I would say probably about 70 percent of our patients have are detained under a section of the mental health act um it's not a dementia ward although sometimes when people are with us they do get a dementia diagnosis because we suspect something's going on um but as steph said before the when i'm doing um capacity assessments the biggest reason i'm asked to do them and it's normally by solicitors is because someone's got a dementia diagnosis or maybe a head injury um, or sometimes learning disability. And there's a question mark there around capacity. Um, I would say the vast majority that I've done, people actually I've assessed them as having capacity, um, sometimes not. Most of the court of protection applications for deputyship, they haven't, most of them haven't. But if it's an assessment around making a will or um, an LPA, then in most cases I've assessed someone as having capacity because a threshold for making an LPA is not that high. You haven't got to understand really complex information. Um, and in terms of the Mental Health Act, um, there's lots of different sections of the Mental Health Act. The length of sections varies. Um, most people would be detained under um, a section two, which is up to 28 days, or a section three, which is under six, up to six months. That doesn't mean to say that they're going to be detained for the full length of 28 days or six months. It's just up to. So sometimes someone will come into, into our ward um, uh, detained under section two, and they'll actually be, be discharged off the section within a week because it depends what what's caused it in the first place. Some people come in because they um, they are considered to be a risk to themselves. They might have attempted suicide. Um, they might have done something, um, as I say, to, to seriously self-harm. Some people come in um, because, especially with older people, a lot of people come in because... Um, they're presented with some form of confusion. Sometimes, on off, quite often, they've got paranoid ideas. They might think people are trying to break into the house. They might think someone's trying to kill them. And it might be that, that the reason for that is actually that they've got an underlying infection. Um, so we do a lot of physical health screening, especially on older people. And it might be that they've got a urinary tract infection and that's what's causing it all. And as soon as you treat that with antibiotics, they're fine. Um, and the difference sometimes between someone coming in, even under a section, who's completely um, confused and deluded and, and appears quite, um, for want of a better word, crazy, the difference that can happen in a matter of a week is amazing sometimes. Um, so just because someone's detained under the Mental Health Act as well, it doesn't mean to say that they haven't got capacity to make decisions about their finances. It's unlikely you'd have that come into effect if someone's in, only in for a short space of time. But we do sometimes have people who are with us for maybe up to nine months. Um, and that tends to be where they've had lots of assessments and it's decided that they can't really manage to go back home or go back to where they came from. 
where, wherever that might be. It might be sheltered housing. It might even be a care home. And we're looking for another placement. It's very similar to what happens in a general hospital where they're trying to find somewhere for someone to go. And during that time, it might be that some decisions need to be made about um, finances because it might be about moving into a care home, which might involve paying care home fees. Um, there might be other decisions to make. Um, but just because someone's under a section of the Mental Health Act doesn't mean to say they haven't got capacity to make those decisions about their finances. Um, capacity is decision specific. So each decision to be made, um, we would assess around whether the person's got capacity to make that decision. Um, and always start from the basis of an assumption of capacity, which is the first principle of, of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, so normally that would happen in hospital. Um, if if they're with us, say, say they're in that situation for nine months, then it would probably be our staff, uh, the doctors and the social workers um, who would make um, that assessment of capacity. Um, but as but as I say, I suppose with Steph saying earlier, just because you've got a particular diagnosis or just because you're detained under the Mental Health Act doesn't mean to say you haven't got capacity to make decisions about your finances. Um, Are there specific sort of sections of capacity um, or, or is it quite fluid? No, there's not. Not really. No, I mean, the 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 way we assess capacity, um, obviously, I've done extensive training is is set out in law. We we also follow a lot of case law. One of the things as a mental capacity assessor I have to do is keep up to date with case law because it does change. Um, there's cases going through court all the time. Um, so there's a lot of guidance. There's um, and it again. Yes, I suppose there's levels of um when I assess someone, sometimes it's absolutely clear they've got full capacity. There's no level of confusion whatsoever. And then with other people, it might be a bit like, I'm not quite sure here. So that's when I'm digging deeper into questions. Um, and the particular areas where you struggle in capacity is someone might be able to understand the information. Someone might be able to retain the information, but can they use that information and weigh it up so that's when it becomes more difficult um, and the more complex the decision they're making the more difficult it is um, that's why i say around making an lpa the the threshold for capacity isn't that high because being able to understand what an lpa is is not that complex but if I'm, for example, doing an assessment for deprivation of liberty, the person needs to understand about how they came to be in the care home, um, what their care needs are, um, what the conditions of living in the care home is, why the door's locked, why people aren't allowed out. Um, that's a much higher level of um, capacity needed. Okay. Um... And in terms of how, how often do you get involved in terms of people being detained under the Mental Health Act? Is it is it quite rare or is it is it is it quite common or more common than you would expect? Well, with my nursing hat on, <laughs> um, I work on an inpatient unit. Um, so, as I say, when people come in to us, I would say about 70 percent have been sectioned. But that sectioning usually takes place in the community um, it requires um, psychiatrist and social worker and they involve family and that takes place and the person's sectioned and brought in. Sometimes we have people who are brought in or who come in informally. That means that they've come in of their own free will and then they want to leave. And if they want to leave, then as a registered nurse, if I'm on duty, then I need to assess whether I think it's safe for them to leave. And if I don't think it's safe for them to leave, then I can um, do what's called a section, uh, section five, four, um, and I can detain them for up to seven hours until a doctor gets there. And then the doctor, the psychiatrist will assess them again and um, decide whether they need sectioning. And that happens sometimes. Um, 
but that that's when I get involved. Um, and also you, people's rights. We have to read someone their rights every week um, and when they're detained under the Mental Health Act and assist them as well if they want to appeal against their section because there is a right of appeal. And a number of patients do win their appeal as well. Um, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes there's cases where I think, well, why is this person sectioned? I don't always agree with the doctor. Um, yeah. I can imagine it, um, you giving, getting your rights read when you're uh, detained under the Mental Health Act doesn't really feel like you've got many rights at all. I'm speculating that that's... Well, probably... some people, um, we're obliged to do it, yet sometimes you have to be extremely tactful how you do it because, you know, I struggle with it sometimes because I think, well, I know this person doesn't think there's anything wrong with them and objects to being detained. So me coming along and reading them their rights is mm. not exactly um it's difficult but we're obliged to do it what, but sometimes you're obliged to do things that you think are not the best thing really so, so what in a nutshell what are the rights that they have when they're detained to, to well it's mainly to if they're detained it's mainly around the right to appeal but also depending on which section it is um if they're detained under a section two then they can't be given medication against their will right. if they're detained under section three then they can but it also needs a second opinion so there's different depending on which section it is but whatever section of the mental health act they're detained under they've got a right of appeal mm -hmm. and a lot i say a lot of patients do appeal and some do win no. Okay. Well, sorry, we have gone uh, hugely over now, and I, I know it's sort of it's, it, we're trying to fit the, the 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 topics that we've covered in both this session and the last one was was good going um, from from Lynn, uh, Steph, and Nicola. So, thank you very much, guys. Um, we're going to have to call it a day now, and I really appreciate uh, Lynn, Steph, and, and Nicola giving up their their sort of start of the day to come and and, and impart their knowledge. We have put the first one onto um, a, I'm gonna say a podcast. It's a recording. This podcast sounds too much. But if anyone would like it or if they want the recording, uh, it's on LinkedIn, I think. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll put it out. This one will probably be following suit. So there's a bit of a um, continuity there. But I'll send an email out to everyone that's been on with the guy's contact details. So if you need to speak, obviously you can. And I'll be in touch soon. I hope you have a, a, an enjoyable rest of your Friday. And um, yeah, once again, thank you for joining us. And I will look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.